Good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, 3 p.m. today, April 8th, and uh, we have a new uh, chapter of our series of online technology meetings. Uh, in this case, we are going to talk about photonics technologies to improve uh, pharmaceutical processes. Um, that is a very interesting topic that covers quite different technologies, and uh, we are going to have a very nice set of speakers today to cover uh, the different uh, different approaches and also, as I mentioned, different technologies that can be applied to uh, pharmaceutical industries and also the chemical industry that is somehow uh, related. Uh, in case somebody doesn't know what is EPIC, um, just a brief introduction. We are the European Photonics Industry Consortium. Uh, we are a, a consortium of more than 800 corporate members that are both companies and also research centers. And our goal as the EPIC staff is to help people to connect with each other uh, on one side to improve the business um, capabilities and other side also to help with uh, any kind of technological request uh, that, that your company may have. Um, and in, in, in any case, to find new partners or collaborators uh, to develop uh, uh, your, your, your products uh, and, and, and your business lines. This is a, a picture of the EPIC staff that uh, we took uh, in, in last year in the AGM uh, that um, uh, we are going to have again uh, in next week in, in south of France in Juan Spins. Um, so this is a summary of all the benefits that we offer to our members. Uh, most of you know that you can have access to uh, market reports that um, experts uh, create about different topics and different um, uh, particular markets um, and uh, help companies also to learn about how to access those markets or um, a little bit about the future trends and the future numbers uh, in them. Uh, we also help with uh, mentorship, with uh, human resources, uh, using our website, Joffin Photonics. Um, also, we connect um, investors uh, with companies that need uh, these uh, kind of investments. Um, and as I mentioned, we cover technological requests and also networking uh, requests uh, for those of you. Uh, in particular, the annual general meeting that is showing this picture is a good opportunity to meet with uh, different uh, companies from the whole supply chain, um, including integrators and users and also manufacturers of components and service providers. Uh, so everybody um, can discuss uh, their, their needs and their, their solutions uh, with uh, somebody that is, is relevant for them. Uh, just an overview, because as we have this online meeting, we also complement with other uh, physical meet meetings or in person events. As I mentioned, the general meeting next week already in south of France. Um, we are also going to cover uh, photonics for agri-food industry, in this case in, in Norway, in collaboration with uh, DigiFoods. Uh, we will have a technology meeting for photonics for a uh, XR uh, including AR, VR as well at Microsoft in, in Finland. Then we will have uh, one about photonic integration and packaging that is a hot topic nowadays in Berlin, hosted by Fraunhofer ICDM, uh, and also in the specialty optical fibers. That is a very interesting topic uh, covering uh, also uh, topics in medical and in healthcare that can be related with the pharmaceutical in industry in Lannion in France. And the last one in photonics for miniaturized optics at uh, Sony in, in Austria. Um, and as I mentioned, we complement with the online meetings, not only related with technology, but because we try to offer um, different um, benefits to our members. Also, uh, a world group meeting in human resources, also in sustainability. Um, and one of the market reports that we will have soon available about Raman technologies that is going to be presented by Thematis. 
and we will complement with online technology meetings on quantum communication and also in photonics for thin film fabrication. And I would like to highlight the meeting that we'll have tomorrow in case somebody is not a member of Epic or is interested in learning more about the benefits and also talking with our uh, director, CEO, Carlos Lee. I will have tomorrow a meeting to explain all the membership benefits, any question that you may have, any information that uh, uh, could be interesting for you. You can join tomorrow, check our website. Um, you can register for free and, and join the discussion and the, and the um, presentation from our, our CEO. And I would like to mention these are the next events, the ones I presented, but there is also one event that is going to be later this year, uh, probably interesting for most of you that are related with life science and healthcare. It's going to be a, a, a meeting in um, uh, photonics technologies for medical diagnosis and treatments. Uh, we had a very interesting meeting last year in cancer diagnosis and therapy in Antwerp University Hospital. And um, we were forced by the audience to repeat the topic again. So we are going this time to Barcelona, uh, to uh, the Photonics Center ICFO, uh, that is part of a, a cluster of uh, medical uh, hospitals and clinics uh, in the area in Catalonia. Uh, so we will talk again about cancer diagnosis and treatment, but we will also talk about more general blood diagnosis, glucose monitoring. Uh, so we will open a little bit more the topic to uh, include other um, solutions that need photonics technologies for sure, including wearables or biosensors. So feel free to go to our website also and check the information. We will have um, the structure of the agenda soon there, and we will start inviting the, the first speakers and keynote speakers as well. And we are also part as part as EPIC of uh, different uh, European Union projects. Uh, as you see here, we cover different um, different uh, technologies and, and markets, uh, including uh, laser processes, including free-form optics, uh, photonic integrated circuits as well, um, and then monitoring solutions. But in this case, I would like to highlight two of them. Uh, one is MedPub, that is a pilot line that is dedicated to manufacturing, testing, uh, validating photonics technologies. So any company that are interested in develop a uh, technology, a photonics technology, um, uh, a medical device, sorry, for, uh, based on photonics technologies, um, can uh, apply for a, a request or can send a request to MedPub that they can help in any of the process going from uh, design and characterization to uh, mass uh, manufacturing. Uh, so feel free to check the website of the of this pilot line that is going now in the process from uh, European Union project to an association. Uh, so they could all the members that they could help you with all, with your need. Uh, and then of course we are uh, participating in Photo Hub uh, Europe. Um, so any requests related with photonics technologies can be applied there, and uh, they've said the the bunch of experts there can help you uh, with your development using photonics technologies. Uh, and this is the people that uh, registered today uh, in their in our uh, meeting. So we have a nice, a very nice group of, uh, uh, of companies covering the whole supply chain. Um, so I would like to encourage you uh, that are uh, now uh, joining the, the room um, to uh, be panelists and also to type in the webinar chat if you want um, your name, your company, and what are you doing? So uh, then uh, people can see uh, which are your expertise uh, that perhaps is not clearly shown here in this big slide that I will show just um, a few seconds more. So feel free to use the the chat, um, the chat, uh, the webinar chat that is available in this in this room to uh, to place your uh, the expertise of your company so people can can know what you do. And also, if you have any any request of any question, you can use the question and answers box and also this this webinar chat. Uh, and this is the agenda that we will have for today. So as I mentioned, we have a very nice set of speakers. Uh, we will start with a presentation from Alvaro Goyanes, co-founder and director by uh, FAF Rex. And we will continue with Mark Ricker from Horiba, uh, Mark Ladive from Shenix, uh, Florent Tibol from uh, Kiova, and also uh, we'll finish with Josep Pouvet uh, from PhotoHub. So uh, we will have, as I mentioned, different technologies, uh, different point of view. So it's going to be a very interesting meeting and um, with this, I finish my time here. So I would like to introduce you, Alvaro Goyanes, as I mentioned, co-founder and director of uh, FabRx. So Alvaro, the floor is yours. Feel free to share uh, your screen and start your, your presentation. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Antonio, for the introduction. And, and first of all, thank you for the opportunity to, to present here. I'm going to share my slides. Yeah. So... Um, 
Yeah, my, my name is uh, Alvaro Goyanes. I'm coming from Spain, but I'm presenting, representing a company that is uh, based in London in the UK. It's called Fabrics. Uh, and our company is focused basically on pharmaceutical uh, 3D printing. So we use 3D printing to make uh, medicines. Um, this company is a spin-out company from UCL, University College London. Uh, and I'm also working in Spain as a lecturer in University of Santiago de Compostela. So I'm a bit uh, multitasking doing industry and research at, at the same time. So why uh, using 3D printing for pharmaceutical applications? Well, uh, right now medicines are produced mass manufacture. So we have centralized facilities where we manufacture uh, hundreds or millions of tablets and these tablets are distributed all, al all around the world and are used to treat uh, diseases from very different patients. So most of the times we have a big variety of patients that receive the same medication and this medication sometimes is not effective. Actually, there are reports that says that only 30 to 70, uh, 30 to 60 percent of the medicines that we give to patients are effective. Uh, and this is a big problem because sometimes 70 percent of the medicines are not effective. Our approach is to to make medicines personalized, closer to the patient, and give to each patient a specific medicine. And, and this is our approach. And there are no automatic methods of making personalized medicines. And our approach is to use a pharmaceutical 3D printing to print actually tablets with the medicine, with the drug inside that you can give to the patients. We call them 3D printed tablets uh, or printlets. Uh, this is a, a, our contribution to the English language. And and this here, you can see an example of a pharmaceutical 3D printing. So we have a mixture of excipients and drug that goes through a print head and we print directly into a blister packing. Now, there are many 3D printing technologies. This is an example of uh, extrusion material. Uh, and this is one of the pharmaceutical 3D printers that we develop. You can see a camera system here. Uh, you could also see a, a, a bill plate this is the build plate with a balance incorporated. And, and why we have a camera and a balance? Because quality control of these medicines is key. And, but first of all, why we want to make medicines personalized or how this is going to be implemented in the future? Our vision is that in the future, the patient is going to go to the medical doctor because there is a therapeutic need, either a, a wearable device or a blood test or, or the patient realized that something is wrong. Uh, the medical doctor is going to be to give a digital prescription to, to this patient if this uh, problem can be uh, resolved with medication. This is going to be sent to the pharmacy and transformed in a 3D digital design that is going to be sent to a 3D printer that is going to be in a hospital or in a pharmacy. And we are going to get the personalized medicine. This personalized medicine is administered to the patient and depending on the outcome, the clinical outcome, uh, we might need to go through this cycle again. We call it virtual cycle of personalized medicine because every time the patient goes through this cycle, the patient uh, is getting better and better medication and we are generating a lot of data. Obviously, to make this a reality, uh, we need software uh, to control the, the printer, software to predict the right dose, pharmaceutical 3D printers, pharma inks, artificial intelligence to control the whole system. And what is critical is to have a quality control methods for, for these uh, manufactured medicines that we produce in a small scale. So we will have in the future printers, software, the pharma ink, that is the material that we put in the printer. Uh, our idea is that in the future we will have a kind of Nespresso model that uh, pharmaceutical companies manufacture this uh, pre-fill uh, cartridges or blisters uh, with the with the medicine that are included in the printer and then uh, the pharmacist in the pharmacy or in the hospital select the right dose for this uh, person. So to make this a reality, uh, as I said, we need quality control systems. It's not like in mass manufacturing that we have millions of tablets and we select a, a group of tablets, we analyze and we say everything is fine. Uh, we cannot destroy these tablets. If we are making a, a batch of a small uh, 28 tablets treatment for, for one month for the patient, we need to be sure that these tablets 
have the right dose without uh, destroying the tablets. So the, our approach is to use balance. So we know the weight of the tablet. And if we know the weight, we are pretty sure that we are getting the right dose if we have the right composition, the right mixture. So how can we make uh, a decision about the right composition? In our case, we are using NIR, we are evaluating Raman. So uh, we are using a spectroscopic methods for quality control. And this is key. We, we have several studies, uh, some of them with uh, other pharmaceutical companies like Lausanne, where we evaluate the use of NIR or Raman or other technologies, spectroscopic technologies, as a process analytical technologies to implement in this, uh, in, in this 3D printing technology. Process analytical technology include a, a wide variety of technologies to control the process. Uh, in the pharmaceutical industry, for mass manufacturing, is something that is uh, being implemented right now. Uh, for continuous manufacturing, is critical. Uh, but here, in these small batches, is even more critical because we cannot destroy the small batch and say, yeah, the batch was fine. Uh, so we need to find these non-destructive methods. In our company, we use uh, these photonics, uh, spectroscopic methods, but we don't develop the spectroscopic methods. So in this case, the NIR that we are using is from uh, Viavi. Uh, we tested from many different manufacturers, uh, different NIRs and RAMARs, and we are evaluating the models and the software and, and all the, the full equip uh, for uh, implementation in pharmacies. What else we do related with photonics? So one part is process analytical technology that as I said is key. And the other part is like, well, 3D printing you saw, well, I, I showed the video is not very fast. And we thought like, is there a way of having something that is fast? Like the replicator from Star Trek that you have something appearing there immediately. Uh, and we thought, well, probably the closest method to get something similar would be something that is called volumetric printing. In volumetric printing, we have a, a monomer uh, or a resin with monomers that thanks to the light uh, goes from liquid to solid. So we have photopolymerization. And here you can see in seven seconds, we are able to create uh, a object, no? the object. So we are evaluating different uh, uh, methods that are based on photopolymerization. We use uh, DLP projectors from different angles to make these uh, formulations. Uh, we are far from reaching the market because the materials that we are used are not pharmaceutical grade excipients, uh, are materials that are used for other pharmaceutical applications like uh, contact lenses, but are not commonly used in, in medicines. But I think there is a lot of potential uh, with this technology to make medicines in the future. Um, so uh, in, in one of our studies, as I said, we use a DLP projector and we are projecting light into our uh, container that contains like a mixture of monomers and drag. So the drag is inside this uh, resin. So whenever we get an object, it solidifies and this object contains the drug inside. So we can swallow the object and then the drug is released. So we are making tablets using uh, volumetric printing. Uh, we have some crazy ideas um, and we think like, well, maybe in the future medicines are going to be manufactured at home. And we develop like uh, a kind of uh, home printer for pharmaceutical products uh, that uses the light of uh, our cell phone that, that we can have uh, to print medicines. So the light of the screen of this cell phone uh, makes uh, the same process of photopolymerization on a bill plate, and we are able to make medicines uh, overnight for a patient that could take them next day. So this is a proof of concept. Again, we are far from implementation. The real technology for implementation is the first one that is material extrusion, where we are using photonics for quality control. But there are, these are very interesting applications for the future and, and for research. And this is the, the team from Fabrics, the company. We have collaborations with many uh, pharmaceutical companies, universities, uh, research institutions. So we are always happy to collaborate. So you can send me a, an email. And if you are interested in this topic, we, we have an article that is quite a good article translating 3D printed uh, pharmaceuticals from hype 
to real world clinical applications. Obviously, the Star Trek ap approach was the hype, no? but we have the, the real world clinical applications and we have done clinical studies in, in some of the biggest hospitals in, in Europe. Uh, that's all from my part. I'm happy to, to answer questions. Thank you. So thank you very much, Alvaro, for the nice presentation. And uh, we have time uh, now time for question and answers. So I encourage you to raise your hands and uh, switch on your camera so you can make your question for Alvaro. Um, I can perhaps start to break the ice. Um, in the 3D printing, um, is, is there critical for you the location of the uh, active ingredients? So do you need to design uh, um, how the, the all the ingredients are going to be located then in the final in the final product? Um, or at the end, it's not so important. Uh, and what's the accuracy in cases it's, if it's important? Yeah, in, in some cases it's important. Uh, for example. Uh, Obviously, in 10 minutes, I, I cannot explain a lot about uh, 3D printing, but there are many opportunities. One of them is combination of different drugs. So we can have different drugs uh, in a tablet in a tablet with different doses, and these drugs can have different release. No? So for example, we take the tablet and one drug is released in the stomach, the other in the small intestine and colon, uh, or, or different uh, profiles. Uh, for this type of oral applications might not be so important uh, only to control the release uh, it's necessary to know where the drug is or or if we want to create different structures uh, it's interesting uh, i know there are other technologies like uh, two photon photopolymerization that you can have like very high precision mm -hmm. For our application, is not needed, but for others, for example, making implantable device or things like that, could be interesting approach as well, including medicines uh, and uh, focusing on tumors and things like that. But this is not our main focus. And also, like two photon photopolymerization or the one that I was showing, volumetric printing, uh, we need a lot of research regarding the safety of the materials because uh, the monomers. Uh, the, the final product, if there are not monomers, is safe, but you need to wash it you need to remove all the monomers because the monomers are reactive monomers that are not safe, are not considered safe. So uh, the problem is that when you wash this uh, final product, sometimes you remove part of the drug. So it's not the most efficient method to, to make medicines. So resolution could be a, a, a good uh, assets, uh, I would say, a uh, good asset or, or advantage. But in, in our case, it's more focused on personalization. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we can make very complex uh, designs that could be useful for some applications. And that's where uh, SLA printing, DLP printing mm -hmm. adds value, obviously. Mm -hmm. or, or for dental applications as well with drugs, that, that would be very interesting. Good, good. And another question about the scalability. Um, uh, in this case, um, are you requested, let's say, in your collaborations with your pharmaceutical companies to go to a solution that can be um, or can be used in mass production? Um, would you still be in the medium production, let's say? No, we are focused on the small production, mm -hmm. um, uh, sh short batches, because our idea is to move closer to the to the patient. So we are talking about what is called a point of care manufacture or distributed manufacture, not mm -hmm. a centralized manufacture. Uh, and that's an advantage because what we want is to make medicines personalized. So we don't want big batches of the same medicine. It's, it's the opposite. And... Um, yeah, I think that's that's the key. But as I said, this is a, a new application, let's say, or or a new area, and most of the future applications are still to be developed. And these uh, requirements for process analytical technology, uh, characterization, and quality control are requirements that we are developing right now. So mm -hmm. there are not clear standards or things like that. Yeah, very good. Very good. So thank you. Alvaro, for your, for your answers. I don't know if there is any other question in the room. Yeah, it's uh, Julian from uh, Coherent. I actually posted my question on the chat, but maybe I can I can jump in. Yeah, I don't see the question, Julian, so please uh, bring your question. Okay. How, how would it work from a regulation standpoint? I mean, the regulatory approval for drugs is very stringent. So who would, who would bear the liability in case there is misdosage? 
in such a different manufacturing setup? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. So right now the, we are doing clinical studies with, with, as I said, in Europe, in some hospitals. And right now the regulation that we are using is the regulation of uh, compounding. Compounding is uh, the manual manufacture of medicines in hospitals. And in this case, the responsibility is uh, responsibility of the pharmacist preparing these, these medicines. Uh, regulation is going to change uh, here in the UK there is a new regulation that is going to be in place hopefully this year or next year about point of care manufacture. Uh, in the US as well, the FDA is bringing a new regulation about decentralized and point of care manufacture and the European agency is bringing new regulation. In these cases, uh, I think the new regulation is not clear, but what we are aiming is that uh, responsibility is going to be uh, distributed between the pharmacist using the, the printer, the printer manufacturer, and the pharma ink manufacturer. So in the future, right now, the pharmacist is preparing the pharma ink, the material that is going inside the printer. In the future, what we want is that pharmaceutical companies sell this pharma ink that is going to be used in, in the printer. So the manufacturer of, of this pharma ink is going to have part of this responsibility and this pharma ink needs to be approved by regulatory agencies. But that's what is not ready. What is ready is the compounding approach only. And are the pharmaceutical companies that are interested in supporting the pharma ink concept or is that a threat to their standard business model? Well, the pharmaceutical companies are very slow uh, and it takes ages for them to change. We are working with some of them. Uh, we are working with, I would say, especially faster with small, medium-sized companies, but we are working also with the big ones. The big ones are evaluating the technology and thinking, uh, and the small ones are bringing like business case analysis and saying, I think this is the molecule, we need to do this, this. So uh, I, I think there is a lot of interest. 3D printing in pharmaceutics is a hot topic. Uh, a, a lot of universities are doing research that doesn't mean anything because many researchers, they just do research because they have to do research. <laughs> but uh, but it's a hot topic. So there is interest from industry as well and regulation is changing. So it means that the, there is traction with this technology. Thanks a lot. It's very interesting. Thank you. Uh, we also have a question uh, in the chat. Uh, so uh, Fabio Calegari from Sony. Uh, Fabio, you can uh, join. Uh, you can. I will make your question, but you, if you want to join the discussion, feel free. And Fabio is asking: Have you ever investigated possible application of uh, small, small smartphones-based solutions in the context of space missions? Uh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, w when I have time, I say that uh, 3D printing, the possibilities of 3D printing are, are limitless. And we actually published an article about potential opportunities of using 3D printing in space. Not specifically about the smartphone approach, but other uh, technologies like volumetric, because uh, in the space, if we go to Mars, uh, we are not going to bring the medicines with us. So we are going to need uh, to manufacture our medicines in, in uh, starships or, or in other uh, planets. So we are not going to bring a tableting machine that weighs like two tons. We need to think about new technologies and 3D printing could be one of the technologies. Uh, we had conversations with people from, the, from NASA and the European agency about ideas, but we don't have like a proper project. We published a, a review article with, with our ideas and I think it's the technology moving forward. Uh, so could be possible. Good. So I think it's, it's answer, and I don't see any other question. So uh, thank you very much, Alvaro, for the nice presentation, and good luck for this uh, new adventure. It, uh, it's very interesting, all the projects that you are involved in. Thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, we can move to our next speaker. So for me, it's a pleasure now to introduce you, uh, Marcus Ricker. He's Director of Innovation at Oriva, um, and he's going to give us uh, his... Uh, point of view of uh, added value along the chemical and pharmaceutical production chain. Uh, so, Marcus, we were in a very nice uh, time in Jena a few weeks ago, so I, I, I'm i still uh, impressed by your presentation there, so I'm happy to hear you again. 
Thank you very much, Antonio. Uh, let me share my screen. Yeah, well, welcome everybody. Um, today I would like to talk uh, a little bit about the value chain uh, along pharmaceutical and chemical uh, production. And uh, what I would like to talk about is how to transform from a company that is dealing a lot with laboratory instrumentation. Um, Oriva is very well known for spectrometers, Raman, fluorescence, but also for particle size uh, measurement analysis. And how to transform uh, from the viewpoint of delivering laboratory equipment towards the production chain. And um, so I don't know if uh, in the audience we have people that are, are considering to have their own company in the future, maybe. Uh, some of the questions that I raise here are questions that you also need to answer for yourself. Uh, in order to be successful in this in this field. And actually, I don't make a big difference between chemical and pharmaceutical production because um, more or less the, the processes are going to be uh, similar in the future. So if we, if we start about market trends, and there's, uh, I don't think, not much new. Everybody knows this. Um, climate neutral chemistry is a big topic uh, in, in Europe. Um, there are ways to do this um, in order to do uh, process simulation, to uh, actually optimize production processes on the PC uh, before the actual installation takes place. So um, this is an important topic. Uh, there's also um, the idea of modularization. Uh, we have here smart factory to bring medicine to market faster. Time to market is an issue. And modularization uh, also, like Alvaro said, um, maybe in the future, everybody has his own drug. So of course, the production processes need to adapt to this situation uh, if we are doing small batch uh, production. And one of the big topics also, since I mentioned batch, is a batch to continuous production for scalability issues. So those are all the, the market trends that uh, we as a, as a supplier uh, of the industries uh, need to be aware of and uh, also discuss how we can support our customers and partners in the transformation to get uh, these things implemented. Coming from the market trends towards the technology trends, um, this is actually a little bit older from Aviva in 2019. So I think it's still pretty much up to date, uh, the three years of Corona crisis, uh, actually was a drawback uh, in, in the sense of uh, innovation. So I think most of the things are, are still uh, uh, valuable that we see here. So we have the, the market environment, uh, the industry trends. However, it's questionable if uh, digitalization is an industry trend because uh, in my point of view, nobody's performing digitalization uh, just to have it digitalized. There has to be uh, a certain reason for this. And one of the reasons for digitalization is, as a technology trend, the digital twin that you see here. And there's also a small uh, um, description. Uh, it's, a, it's a virtual model. And this is actually very vague. It could be a product, it could be a process or a service. And the idea is to use simulation uh, algorithms to predict how my process uh, my production process would work uh, in the future. And why are we doing this? Well, uh, as mentioned, we have to shift towards smaller batch production. Um, we have to support sustainable production, actually in the, in the sense of uh, resource uh, and energy efficiency. And um, we have to do digitalization and virtualization for the optimization of production processes. And of course, the product quality and accuracy uh, is key and also the reporting uh, of the quality, um, you know, the, the area of uh, audit trails is, uh, is a big topic as well. And uh, I over exaggerate a little bit. Uh, we do not only see these very nice um, installations, spotless, uh, brand new, no, as a supplier, we also see something probably not as bad as in this picture, but similar 
to this environment. And uh, if we talk about Raman spectrometers being placed in an environment like this, there are some uh, special topics to consider. So brownfield installations and brownfield digitalizations is going to be, in my point of view, a big topic in Europe. Uh, looking at the uh, the times needed to get permissions for uh, additional production uh, sites uh, in in Europe um, is a is a hassle. It takes several years till uh, uh, it's uh, it's possible to build a new production site. So I think uh, a lot of companies are um, extremely interested in uh, optimizing uh, existing installations, and uh, of course. Uh, there's also some, some support required in that field. So what are the customer requirements? And uh, what you see here on the right is um, probably pretty much known to, to most of you. Um, it's the, the letter uh, from the planned instrumentation all the, ways, all the way up to the enterprise level controls, um, you know, ending up with the enterprise resource planning uh, layer on top of, uh, of actually of the paramite. So in the plan instrumentation, we have valves, we have sensors, uh, we have robots, um, we have 3D printers. Yeah. So this is what we see in the in the uh, installation in the production area. So in the in the past, the sensors were actually implemented here, and everything else was left to um, other other suppliers, other vendors. And the question is now with the, with the knowledge that a company has on the specific sensor type, on the limitations of the sensor, on the strengths of the sensor, whether it would make sense to extend the knowledge base to also enable applications to work on the plant level controls. And um, that's a discussion that uh, as a company, uh, you should have, yeah. whether this is uh, something that uh, you want to provide to your potential customers. Actually, in my point of view, it's absolutely necessary uh, to move up uh, on the ladder here um, in order to support your customers in the future, um, especially when it comes to um, um, simulation of, um, of inline um, analytics uh, for process optimization. So where do we get help? Where do we get help from making all these decisions? And uh, one source of help is the user association uh, of um, the uh, automation uh, uh, users in the um, chemical and uh, pharmaceutical domain. And you can see here some of the, um, of the members of Namur and they have different work groups. And in one of the work groups, they have defined uh, what it's called the uh, NAMUR um, reference architecture of process orchestration. So this is how NAMUR and the work group members see production processes being um, uh, established in the future. Some of them are already. So we have a harmonized communication layer on the software side, and then we simply add elements in the process, almost like USB, uh, and plug those into the communication layer. So this interface here could be Modbus, uh, could be OPC UA, it could be LRDS. And um, then you have your, your device, which could be, in our case, um, maybe a, a Raman spectrometer or a, a fluorescent spectrometer. And this, uh, element needs to talk um, via Modbus or OPC UA or LUTs with the communication layer. On top of the communication layer, we have the orchestration layer. The orchestration layer, those are the SCADA systems that control the production process. And they have a linkage to the enterprise IT um, and then also to an internal cloud, uh, mainly for quality control, but also for the um, for the cloning uh, of production processes um, to go into other regions and also to compare results of the production over different regions. Uh, the difference uh, between here and here is that, you know, sometimes if there are older systems available uh, that are not able to 
talk OPC UA or any of the other interfaces, uh, there has to be a gateway controller. So a gateway controller is nothing else than um, a transcript functionality. So it, on this side, it speaks uh, OPC UA, for example. And on this side, it speaks the propriety uh, um, 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 controller language uh, of the device. So one way to establish or to, to uh, enter the market is to have a system available here. Um, with the embedded chemometrics. Um, so uh, the sensor will analyze uh, the, the process parameters and then distributes those to the um, um, orchestration layer. Um, but I, what I also see is that maybe in the future companies will have their own share on the orchestration layer. Um, and for this here, I see two possibilities. In this case, it's called apps, applications. So one app could be um, an app that realizes different uh, modules that realizes, okay, there are some alarms, there are some um, 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 messages from the de devices, and it could actually go into a reporting. And this could also include um, the, um, um, uh, the uh, reporting of um, changes in the, in the production. Um, uh, set up, for example. And then there's also, I would say, an advanced chemometrics uh, functionality available, not only taking into consideration the, the results from a specific spectrometer, but also uh, taking consideration uh, the results from different sensors along the production chain. And uh, last but not least, there are also two elements that I see in the cloud. Um, one uh, would be for uh, predictive maintenance. So Ideally, the spectrometer would actually upload the data to the process app, and that would actually upload data to uh, the cloud. So as a company, there's a possibility to take a look at the spectrometers and see, oh, um, maybe the laser uh, needs to be replaced in a few weeks or months. Maybe we can actually already set up a call uh, with the customer or set up uh, a service um, uh, uh, for a specific uh, element here. So that's... Uh, very important. What you see down here is um, the area of digital twins, which is uh, today not part of my presentation, but um, this is also going to be an important topic in the future. And of course, for digital twins, um, AI uh, simulation, everybody needs data in order to train the, the models. And therefore, the cloud here could also enable uh, a company to get some data um, that are required for training any, any models. So this is, I think, uh, uh, for us, uh, an important um, um, architecture um, that we uh, are going now to follow closely in the industry and uh, take a look around and see um, to what extent this is actually implemented on customer sites and where we already see this. Other topic when we talk about uh, production processes is always the uh, same question, uh, vertically versus horizontally uh, oriented products. Uh, usually for development, uh, we have um, very dedicated uh, systems um, that are very precisely um, aligned to work for a very specific uh, environment. While with manufacturing and QA, uh, you should actually have a more broader uh, view on your product, um, making sure it's available for a set of different uh, purposes in order not to be too narrow for one application. And uh, there's actually one name that you see here, uh, which is called A-Team, which is our new uh, fluorescent spectrometer, which is actually, um, uh, the beauty is it's uh, um, available for development, um, uh, drug development, also for pharmaceutical, chemical, or biological uh, development, all the way to QA. So uh, we are able to do also the, the content uh, of uh, medicine using the, the A-Team, for example. And talking about process as critical, and if not more critical than, than the spectrometer itself, is the sampling, sampling options, uh, automation, uh, having the appropriate automation software to work uh, with the spectrometer, but also with the, with the sample preparation 
and the sample handling um, in, in, within the process, uh, talking about headline, online and inline um, uh, analytical devices. The sampling needs to be different, especially if you have a very complex uh, sample handling uh, procedure. Um, this, is, this is key. Um, standard operation procedures and workflows, yes, very important. Um, this is important not only for the spectrometer to work properly, it's also very important if, as a customer, um, uh, there, there is a, uh, the task to go towards uh, digitalization and using digital twins in order to make the data consistent, um, the operating procedures needs to be the same. Otherwise, if you train a model, you will get, uh, you will get errors, it will, will fail. Uh, and of course, so many more things as well. And uh, since we, we have to deal with this, um, for us as a company, there are uh, several ways to go forward, to have answers to these questions. And one, uh, one answer is just to buy a company that already knows how to do this. And uh, we are very happy that we uh, were able to find the appropriate company. It's process instruments. Uh, they are um, uh, located uh, in the US in Salt Lake City. And um, uh, process instruments, they have a long heritage in the, um, uh, developing and also um, supplying uh, process Raman system. Uh, mainly in the petrochemistry uh, field, uh, which is uh, very, very time critical. So uh, uh, if there's uh, something wrong in the production process, it's usually minutes before uh, my colleagues from Process Instruments get notified that they are, need to adopt to uh, something, some changes in the, in the process. So they are, uh, for us, a very good source um, to get uh, to know more about the the uh, challenges of this uh, new market. Yeah, and then I, I wrote down, this is actually my last slide, and I wrote down uh, some of the things that, that I see that uh, um, uh, it's purely my, my, my personal uh, um, uh, opinion here. Um, it's, we, we always, and on a global scale, uh, I mean, every week we we are um, confronted or we have a phone call or an email from, from researchers in the pharmaceutical field, from universities, uh, from uh, PhD students, um, that they need uh, our system to do this. And this is so important and we have to do it right now. And it's going to be a huge market for us if we just implement a specific function. And um, so what I what I say is it's it's relatively easy to get funding um, and to work towards a specific field, but the rest is hard work. So um, for us, it's always a question, okay, are we still in a, in a position where it's basic R&D via TRL of two and three, or is this already advanced and we can really consider that uh, this new product will, will uh, actually hit the market? Work backwards from your ultimate desired solution. Yeah, so that would be our approach that we would like to do. So we know what we want and then base grants on that. Um, not only understand the problem, but also the acceptable solution. One doctor is easy to convince, many are not. Also, I'm not sure if one doctor is easy to convince. I've seen also challenges here. Um, clinical trials are bloody expensive, yes. Uh, and of course, uh, also uh, we discussed this before, the um, the ten year uh, minimum um, proof of concept requirements uh, and the FDA regulations is also, of course, uh, could be a showstopper uh, when having a new system uh, on the market. And then, of course, we also have to be critical. Yeah, just because Raman is great and A team looks cool, doesn't mean it should be used. Yeah, if there's uh, an established uh, maybe even cheaper uh, option available. Maybe nobody is able to spend more money. Yeah? And of course, insurance, who will pay for this if we have uh, advanced technologies available? So that's also something that needs to be considered. And um, yeah, of course, there's also a lot of great work with spectroscopy in biomedical, but also there's some elements that are a little bit, um, I would say, uh, below the radar uh, out there. 
So that's that's all for me for today. Uh, thank you very much, um, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Marcus. So we have time for questions. I can perhaps start again, break the ice. Um, thinking about the technology uh, for this kind of inline measurements, uh, do you think that uh, the companies will stay with one technique that uh, brings most of the information? Or do you think that the future could be the combination of different uh, solutions uh, to uh, have as much information as possible? Thinking that if you have a lot of data, then you need time also to process it and perhaps make things more difficult. So what, what's your feeling about that? I, I think, first of all, I think nobody likes to measure. Nobody likes to spend money on, on measurement devices. So there has to be a specific need to spend that amount of money to have a specific spectrometer on this place. Um, so what we see in some of our um, research projects is that um, nowadays uh, sensor information is used to feed uh, a digital model, like uh, um, um, uh, a database. And then they, they, some of them are trying to have a artificial intelligence uh, running over it. And this artificial intelligence will then um, create a parameter set for a digital twin to simulate how this process behaves. So at the end of the day, if if you the, the, maybe the only variation you might have are the educt, um, the educts that lead to the product, and uh, if you control them or if you know your bandwidth of changes on your educts, and you have in the future uh, a profound um, digital environment, you might be able to um, go down or lower the amount of measurements required. Because you, let's say an example, if you if you just need to measure the pH value from an educt in order to have your data model um, giving you information how the process will actually run over the next 30 minutes to one hour, you might just end up with a pH measurement device mm -hmm. um, instead of using a, a spectrometer. So I will, my point of view, it will be a long time till we get there, but I think eventually we will, we will get there in the future. So I think for now, uh, we, will, we will be able to have different uh, measurement devices for different applications uh, because the quality required, the quality of the spectra required um, to go the digital way is quite high. And therefore, you need to have the optimal solution at the moment. Okay. Very good. And uh, you, you mentioned the acquisition of a company to solve uh some, uh, well, not issues, but some needs that Oriva will, will have. Um, do you have any other needs that uh, perhaps um, other companies can help you to solve uh, what's in the future of Oriva that other members perhaps can help you, other companies can help you with? Yes, uh, actually, we are very interested to cooperate uh, when it comes to the digitalization layer. So uh, if there's uh, somebody out there um, with uh, specific uh, know-how on uh, specific digital twins for specific applications, uh, we would be very interested in that. And so trying to create a reference um, a path from uh, the, the uh, experiment to the spectrometer to getting the data to creating uh, a digital twin and trying to simulate uh, the outcome of the experiment. That's something that would be highly, highly interested in. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I will ask you if you uh, can place your uh, email in the in the chat. I will do that. Uh, so people can interested also in, in contacting you regarding this topic um, and send you an email. Perfect. So I don't know if there is any other question in the room. I don't see any other. So thank you again, Marcus, for being thank here. You, and thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, and we can move to our next speakers. So I would like to introduce you. Mark Ildip is Director of Strategic Marketing, Marketing Worldwide at Shenix. Um, and uh, Mark, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, so I share my screen. Just confirm me that it's OK you see it. Yeah, everything is good. Good. 
<laughs> okay, uh, so thank you very much, Antonio. Uh, hello, everybody. I will just uh, give uh, a small talk about how the infrared imaging can uh, can help and is used for improving the, uh, the process in, in pharmacology. So uh, first of all, as Antonio told me, uh, I'm part of Xenix, but Xenix, in fact, is part of the Exosense group. So I will just give you an, uh, an overview of it. Then we'll explain why you have to broaden the, your view and not stick just to the visible, what you can see, but also what is invisible with the other and you can reveal with the other reference. Then we will have a focus on the infrared. So Exocent, shortly. Uh, so Exocent is in fact a group which is leader in detection and imaging. Uh, Xenix, uh, which is based in uh, Belgium, is now part of the group for a bit more than one year. Uh, and uh, thanks to this uh, acquisition, uh, Xenix master now the all the wavelengths, let's say from uh, UV to long wave infrared. So the group itself is 1,500 employees, much more powerful and big uh, than was just in Xenix. Uh, and yeah, okay, so now we are a big group uh, and we can, let's say, uh, give not only our agility, but also our power to, to help our personals. Uh, so we are all over the world, but the group, let's say that the, the core is based in Europe and uh, Xenix itself is based in uh, Leuven. And uh, in fact, Xenix is part of the advanced imaging group that gather the Leuven uh, group, the group in Roden, Netherlands, in Bensheim in uh, Germany, in Grenoble in France. So we based our uh, expertise and our growth on the on four pillars. The first one is defense surveillance. In fact, you probably heard about photonis on another application, which is uh, defense. So uh, it's still a big part of Exosense Group. Uh, and there is a very big and growing uh, pillar, which is the life science and the environment. And that's where uh, we are involved too uh, with the advanced imaging and also in industrial control. So here today we are in between the life science uh, and the industrial control. And there is also a pillar in the film. So our uh, Xenix is part of the business unit advanced imaging from Exosense. Advanced imaging, that means, uh, let's say, uh, image which uh, is an, uh, a digital output. So it's all cameras uh, for defense, for surveillance, for uh, environment, for industry application, for process monitoring or whatever. Uh, and this from the UV to the long wave infrared. So that's yeah, what we are in. So UV down to uh, lower than 200 nanometers, uh, even visible with the intensified camera, then the short wave uh, with line scan and 2D arrays and uh, a long wave and cool long wave with the uh, 2D uh, microbolometers and cooled cameras. So all these cameras, in fact, are used for industrial application, and uh, we will focus on the infrared. So what I want to, to tell you is, yeah, OK, visible, it's easy to control for process monitoring and so on and so on. But yeah, we have to broaden our, our view and use all the available wavelengths that you can detect with uh, the, the, the Motown tool and especially with the camera. So you can see here uh, small uh, pictures of what you can see uh, with the visible for sure, but also in UV uh, or in infrared. So, uh, okay, it's different, but you can detect things very, very different. In short wave, 
you have some chemical that uh, have a very strong signature in short wave. In long wave, you see the thermal. Usually, that's what we call in thermal imagery. Mid wave, also thermal. We go to UV or X rays. So you can see X ray can see inside. So that's another uh, another part. But today, let's focus on the near and short infrared and on the long wave and to understand what can be the help of these wavelengths for the um, pharma uh, technology and pharma processes. So in short wave, first of all, uh, you have to know that you have, uh, we offer plenty of uh, short wave cameras. So that means you get the digital output and you can let's say, process the data, make detection, uh, recognizance and whatever with this uh, data. So the, the first classical type of camera in shortwave that are used in machine vision or in process monitoring, it's the line scan. Why line scan? Because in a lot of uh, processes, you just uh, you have movement. So just a, a line of detection is sufficient and the image is reconstructed uh, real time by the movement of the item. So that's where you can use a, a square or rectangular pixel with very high speed, lower speed. We even have uh, some sensor that go to space. And uh, we have several re resolution, several uh, wavelengths, and some news are, are coming, even very small ones just for spectroscopy. So if we focus on what is currently in use in pharmacology, so we have the two main lines, uh, product, line scan. So the standard one, which is very compact, low power, lower cost. And the, the one which is a new generation, very, very high speed when you want to make uh, a lot of measurement per second, uh, or when you want to, to, to monitor very high speed processes. So, Basically, these cameras are split between the one with a rectangular, rectangular pixel or with a square pixel. A square pixel is used just to see what is moving and to reconstruct a picture. Uh, so it's kind of imagery. And in short wave, you see that it can make the difference between different items. So here it's for food sorting, but you have exactly the same application in pharmacology. And uh, with a rectangular pixel, usually it's used to make spectroscopy, classical spectroscopy. So, uh, and for sure, this is used to make chemical analysis. And that's one of the big application in pharmacology to, to check the, the value of the component, of the, the, the existence of the component, the purity of the component inside the pills and this kind of stuff. You also have a lot of uh, cameras in 2D, so that's the, let's say classical uh, cameras such as GoPro, but in uh, in short wave. Uh, from the very small one, uh, QVGA format to the SIGGA format, so it gives you uh, more and more resolution from 320 to 56 pixel to 1280 by 1024. Uh, also with different kind of sensitivity and different kind of speed, even very high speed when you want to make uh, typically, again, hyper spectral imagery uh, on fast uh, moving uh, process. These are the cameras that are really dedicated for that. So now if you go to the application, what can you see with that? The first thing is, it's kind of basic, but it's very useful in industry and especially also in pharmacology industry. It's, you can see inside, you can see inside the blister, for example. Uh, so you can check whether you are sure that you put the pill inside the blister, the blister uh, and you are not uh, disreaching uh, nothing. <laughs> and secondly, you can check that you are put the right one with the right content. So this is really uh, both process monitoring and uh, quality inspection. 
So this is typically what you can done and what is done uh, indeed in real life. Another point is you can see through a typical uh, bottle and you can check whether the, the content is really inside the bottle or again, whether it's full of vacuum, let's say. Uh, so even if the bottle, plastic bottle is not transparent to, to, to visible light. So that's really, again, process monitoring to check that you fill the bottle up to the right level. Uh, and, uh, yeah. and after that also uh, quality inspection. So that's the first level. Then the second level is if you make um, uh, analysis of the, the shortwave data that you gather with your cameras, then you can check what is inside. Uh, and really, if you don't mix the pills, and if uh, this is the right pill with the, 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 the right content inside. So using hyperspectral, so typically push boom with a 2D array and a spectrometer in one direction. Uh, so here you use it as typically a quality inspection to check that you did the right content on the right uh, bottle, for example, or the right blister. So that's uh, another, uh, so the second step. And then you have the, the third step, uh, which is how much and what is the homogeneity? So with the, with the hyperspectral uh, and the 2D imagery, you can really check the the content and the homogeneity of the content typically in the pill. Uh, and you can say, okay, average of the pill is this level of active content, but uh, it's not really uh, distributed uh, properly in the pill. You can do that in a big uh, powder uh, basket and Again, this, uh, this could be even worse because uh, if it's not homogeneous enough and you cannot, may not be the right content in the, in the process. So here, this is the third step. You know in, you know what is in, and you know how much and where is it. Okay, so this is typically things that are used uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the pharmacology industry. Then that was for the short wave. Now, if we move to another uh, wavelength in still in infrared, you have the long wave. So again, we have a plenty of cameras in long wave and typically one of the family is very used, very useful for process monitoring. This is the, the, the cameras that are used for thermography. That means they give you the absolute temperature not only the relative temperature, but also the absolute temperature. This could be used to check a process, uh, but not only, it can also be used for very basic thing, but very important one is the final step, the sealing. The sealing to be sure that, yeah, it's, uh, it's well sealed. You will not spill the, uh, the content, but also that you will not have any contaminant coming from the outside. So this is typically something that you can do by thermography, uh, checking the, the temperature and the homogeneity of the temperature and the value of the temperature at the ceiling area to check whether you reach the right temperature, you are not over it, it's homogeneous. And yeah, so that will tell you, yes, this ceiling will be okay or not. And if not, then discard it and uh, check a new one. Okay, so this is typically a quality inspection, but you can also use this thermography for homogeneity of temperature during a process. So that, that's what I wanted to, to show you. Uh, okay, from the exosense uh, point of view and the, the Xenix point of view, uh, you have to, to know that we, this is our skill, 
definitely the uh, infrared imagery. And that's one of our big uh, market, the process monitoring for life science, uh, for pharmacology, for food, for all this kind of biological stuff, let's say. Uh, and here I, I focus on long wave, but we also have UV application. Uh, we are purely European, so there is no, especially the, nowadays, there is no trouble of uh, can you get the, the item from the other side of the world. Uh, the Chinese know it are content, so it's very easy uh, from an administrative point of view. As I said, we are part of the Exosense group, so now we are much more uh, strong. Uh, and very important, we are uh, very keen to support our customers. So because the use of infrared, as it is not visible, sometimes it's a bit tricky to understand and to optimize. In fact, usually customers, they understand, know why they want it. But to optimize it, it's another point. And that's where we will do that. Uh, and that's all for me today. So open to discussion. If you have any question, I will be very happy to answer. So we have a question already, Julien from Coherent. Yes, thank you very much for the very interesting presentation. Uh, two questions. What is the technology you use for your camera sensors for the, both the SWEAR and the LWEAR? And for the illumination, what do you use? So for the technology uh, in shortwave, we use the in-gas technology, which is the most sensitive in short wave to now. Uh, and the, the, fast, the fastest one. You have to understand that we have cameras, line scan that can run at 270 kilohertz uh, per line and 2D at 1,700 hertz full frame. So that's really fast and you need very high quality and uh, I would uh, uh, material for that. And the ingas is a good one, definitely. Mm -hmm. And for long wave, uh, as it is uncooled, because for um, process monitoring, nobody wants to deal with, uh, with a sterling cooler and this kind of very expensive, very hard uh, demanding in maintenance and so on. So we use just uncooled technology. And this is microbolometric technology. Sorry, it's micro what? I didn't catch it. Mi microbolometer and in gas. Microbolometer okay. for long wave, uh, purely European, and in gas, purely European as it is our. Okay, thank you. And for the illumination, what do you use? Is it, do you require uh, illumination? We, we have some experience with uh, some partner uh, for illumination, but we, we are agnostic. Let's say we are not uh, selling the uh, illumination. It's usually the choice of the customer. Either it could be LEDs, uh, either it could be lasers. It depends really on, uh, on what people need. Typically, you can, uh, and some customers are doing it, uh, you can do a kind of uh, hyperspectral or let's say multispectral by multiplexing with several laser sources. Mm -hmm. So we are very open to that. OK. Thanks. Uh, yeah, since we are a manufacturer of laser sources, you can understand my, my interest there. Yeah, I understand. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but it would be interesting that we have a token about that. Yeah, maybe let's, let's catch up. Yeah, I, will, I would be very interested. Thank you. Very good. I don't know if there is any other question for Mark. We can perhaps finish, Mark, with a question about um, what can EPIC do for you. Uh, you saw also some images of uh, Resonom um, head wall as well. So I guess you collaborate with them, supplying sensors and so on. Uh, is there any other topic with other members can help you or um, uh, things that you are looking for? Typically, uh, current good potential partner, also all the, let's, say, let's be general, uh, general all the all the light manufacturer uh, and also all the lens manufacturer are of interest for us for partnership. Okay. That's some, somewhere we can 
we can work together because uh, usually for process monitoring or for uh, inspection, uh, industrial inspection, the, the requirement either in light, either and or and uh, for lenses are very specific. Typically for long wave, you don't care about uh, having a lens, a very good one where you can see at 10 kilometers. Because at 10 kilometers, you are outside the wall of the factory. So nobody cares. <laughs> People mm -hmm. want to see at ah, between half a meter and a meter, typically. <laughs> so it's it's totally different point of view. And that's something we we are very, yeah, we really would like to, to collaborate and partner with some people. Okay, good. So as I did with Marcus, I asked you to place your or to, to put your uh, email in the in the chat yeah. box. Uh, we have, apart from Coherent, we have the other illumination companies. I see also Aspherico here uh, from the lenses point of view. So uh, feel free, as I mentioned, to contact Mark for discussion. And thank you very much for the nice presentation today and for your time, uh, Mark. Thank you. So let's move to the next speaker. Um, so it's, uh, uh, I would like to introduce you, Florent Tibold, is president and CEO of the company Qaba. Um, and we are going to move a little bit um, of uh, the topic to marking, laser marking. Um, so let's see what Kiowa can offer in this in this topic. So Florent, the, the floor is yours. Hi, Antonio. Thanks for the introduction. I uh, hope you're doing well. And I'm not sure, can you see me uh, properly? We, we hear you fine. and we see the presentation fine. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Let, let's move to um, marking question. Uh, there's been a lot of different topics. I mean, it's well interesting, these, um, these meetings. Uh, now we are back uh, to the laser area, the laser marking area. More specifically, we will talk about the fastest permanent marking solution in the market for um, serialization application. So you, you need to identify each of the products with a unique uh, identifier. Uh, so that'll be my, my agenda. I'll start to briefly introduce uh, so Kiova, then our technology, the product and solution that derive from it, and then we'll spend most of the time uh, focusing on the, what kind of application we we serve and see increasingly uh, increasingly emerging in a in a in a pharma world. Um, so Kiova, it's a um, we're a French company located in the region of Lyon. Uh, so we are laser uh, solution manufacturer. So we are founded in 2011. Spent the first 10 years of the company, first half in the service, um, developing uh, innovating application, developing innovating technology, and uh, then uh, the the company pivoted in 2021, getting investors in, taking on this knowledge and packaging that into very high throughput um, microprocessing solution for, for the industry. And, and the bulk of our activities in marking, micro machining here, we'll talk about marking more specifically. Um, so just recently, we, we uh, I mean, we're expanding nicely in a couple of target sectors, like the looks and the pharma is one of them, um, like science strategical partnerships with established industrials. And we, we just, um, uh, close the Serie A, so a couple more millions in the company to accelerate the uh, industrial um, implementation of our Vulcan multi beam laser solution. Mm -hmm. uh, these are our key markets. So, our mission is to, uh, I mean, we've been pioneering since 10 years. So, these multi beam laser solutions for, for late stage personalization, essentially to do a lot of personalization work in this uh, future concept of the industry, what you would like to do as much as possible later down the line. We're offering very high throughput solutions so that the industrial uh, can still manage this, add this new function, specialization function directly in their existing lines. So there are, we have three main markets here. One is surface treatment where you find decoration application in Lux, also texturation application like you can find in transport. But we're more uh, focused here on the two other markets that are related to the individual traceability and the development of uh, product traceability across industry and across sectors to deliver always more uh, more quality, uh, more more cost control, more operational efficiency. And this is 
these are the two sectors where we are very active and that are um, related to the application we'll see. Now. In pharma, this is a, a few examples and a few figures. It's highlighting what we do in these different um, markets. You see on the left, that was surface treatment. That's an example of uh, uh, sustainable direct glass decoration that we are promoting uh, strongly in the Lux with our partner Nere and some really leading brands in, uh, in the Lux uh, right now. You see in the middle uh, center an example of serialization of pharma package. We'll get back to that directly in the glass. And also uh, you see another example of um, a serialization of product. This is a polymer um, electrical goods product where we can, uh, this is a, a typical case where we can deliver uh, four to, to six X throughput increase compared to established solution that are Today. And this is thanks to our multi beam approach that you can see here a sketch that's very easy. Yeah? Um, in a typical laser machine, laser process, you use the laser beam like a pen on a sheet of paper. So it's sequential. And at some point, in terms of throughput, you might be limited by the speed at which you need to move uh, that beam. So our uh, alternative is, uh, is pretty simple is hey, why not moving using several beams at the same time? And this is no new, it's called parallelization. You, you have that all, all across the board in the industry. But what we're bringing you is that you can dynamically um, activate these beams or not. Actually, in fact, you are dynamically redistributing the energy from your lasers so that you're always processing your sample at the maximum speed with the maximum efficient, efficiency from a cost and economical cost standpoint. Uh, we realized this with some uh, uh, special component that are called special line modulators that is now well established mature component and that we, we've been applying um, as a pioneer to the laser marking and micro machining more over the last uh, 10 years. So we've been developing a lot of software, how to best produce, control the beam as how to uh, properly spec and define the uh, reliable operation conditions. And this is what we have put in our different Vulcan product lines that we you can see there. The Vulcan product lines that is uh, available for uh, in uh, in a module uh, approach, uh, like for machine builders, and also since uh, the couple last years, as a standalone marking uh, solution directly for end users or integrators. You you can see here a couple example. I mean, we we do some um, of course custom integration, but the trend is very mostly here now to industry as we have industrialized this platform with uh, some components that you can uh, adapt to the to the customer uh, specific needs. So that will be the Vulcan multi beam laser solution. That's a complement uh, like a full package of uh, application development, the multi beam process that we master, and then the solution that can be delivered in different level of integrations. Um, depending on your on your profile. Uh, these are the few examples of our customers and verticals. So you see, for instance, we, we see a lot of traction in, a, in the Lux uh, right now and the work we do with Nere, for, for instance. And also one of very strongly growing uh, segment is the, the pharma that you can see here. We've been working since 2019 with most of the, the glass producers, also with very high, uh, like top level labs, to develop and uh, establish this um, serialization solution for their products that are uh, coming in. Um, so I'd like to, um, to zoom uh, with you a little bit on three uh, types of uh, application. They're all related to the serialization. So the fact to add a unique code, mostly it's a data matrix code, unique identifier serial number on the production, the ID, uh, and the interest for the um, for the producer, for the industrialist to have a perfect control on its quality and on all these processes. So that can lead to very significant reduction, and specifically in terms of recall, which is very strong in the pharma, or we've seen as well in the electrical sector. This is really very, very strong in these uh, sectors and a very strong motivation for the industrials to develop and add these new, these new functions. Uh, one of the first uh, case, is uh is based on uh, on an evolution that's an actual case now you have laboratories that have uh, set up serialization of sub product uh, marking on uh, this little uh, rubber plunger that you can find it's, it's an elastomer plunger uh this one is marked with our lasers 
Um, and uh, it's made uh, on the fly in a very high speed uh, uh, production where you have 10, uh, around 10 uh, products that are produced uh, per se, 10 new products and 10 single products per second. This is realized with the CO2 laser. Um, this is not a very, um, like um, you, have a lot of, you have debris and you are also limited in the content that you, you can really uh, encode on the product. And this is due to the, the marking time. You, you have to picture these products like moving very fast on the fly and you need to shoot in a little space to mark this, um, this data. So this, this is really, really challenging. The CO2 laser does that with some limitation. Uh, with um, top laboratory, we work on developing a new solution that will be based on uh, what we call uh, full stem marking. So this is an innovation from Kiova where you can mark the whole code in one single post. That means in 10 nanoseconds. So you can do all the marking very easily despite the object is moving very, very fast. And this is what you can see on the top right here. Uh, data matrix 14, 14. So this is five times more information that is encoded in that code. And that really enables an individual traceability of the production that otherwise uh, cannot be traced in a, on a single basis uh, with only uh, the few um, data content of a data matrix 10 by 10 code. Other advantages is that you can reach 10, 20 units uh, per second and that it's uh, coming with no debris, which will prevent costly uh, unplanned lines to pitch. So that's um, that's the first illustration on multi-purpose pharmaceutical containers and the marking of the rubber plunger. Uh, we've been also quite uh, been working a lot on developing serialization solution directly on syringes. So that are uh, single use syringes here with one example here being the, the marking of the end cap that is called RNS. In, uh, in that uh, sector on the, on the end cap of the syringe, this is a propylene uh, tap. And so we've been developing, as you can see, a very nice um, marking um, solution here where you can mark in less than 30 milliseconds. In that, um, in that marking situation here, you, you have a batch, like you have hundreds of syringes that are being uh, brought to the, together and you have uh, a few seconds available to individually uh, track them all. So this is what we can do here. Um, we've developed a process um, that has a depth of focus of several millimeters, which is very much the integration on the existing line. And that's um, that's really a benefit of our uh, technologies. And uh, as you can see here, we, we, we had to um, to use a femtosecond laser. This This was to... Uh, maintain the same level of quality and readability on the codes, depending on different batch suppliers. This is, of course, very, very important for, for the industrials that you keep exactly the same process despite different supply. And that's, um, from that point of view, a very good um, advantage of short pulse laser. Even though they are a little, they are a little, they are really more expensive. They they do provide this homogeneity and the result that is very high value for this type of industries. And the last um, example, as far as I'm concerned, which is really the same application on syringe, uh, single-use syringe hour, where in that case, we're able to deliver that marking, 20 unique markings per second, directly on the glass uh, containers. And this is also totally new because um, over the last, I mean, 10 years, it's, it was never been possible to cold mark uh, glass like this without creating micro cracking, at least at the level of uh, quality that the, the pharmaceutical sectors uh, requires. And this is something we've um, succeeded in realizing with the multi-beam approach. And mostly because you see, we will be marking very gently on the surface instead of scribing in and on like this. So it's, it's why uh, you, you, you do not um, prepare the material for the next post. And so in that case, that was playing out not very well. And with the building team in marking approach, we're able to do this very uh, small one millimeter mark with a controlled contrast so that you have a very stable vision, but not uh, messing up the inspection. And you can uh, ensure that cold marking without the micro cracking. So fit to a uh, pharmaceutical uh, requirement. So that means you can, it's possible to add directly on an existing line, a uh, marking solution where you would mark permanently on the, the glass container. And so this is um, 
this is really an innovation and we help a uh, step forward in implementing serialization for uh, the pharmaceutical industry. Um, so Antonio, that's pretty much for me. I'm not sure how, um, how long was the presentation so far? Uh, but this is so this is our uh, my conclusion slide uh, around what um, like um, what we can do for you, what you can do for us, Epic. Um, so thanks first for uh, for listening. What we can do for you, you've seen that. Uh, we were a laser laser application expert and we've been developing this new solution. Uh, with an idea to improve the manufacturing, or at least contribute to improving manufacturing and using inline mass customization of your product. And this is uh, really, uh, really what we can uh, do uh, for you. So we are very happy that you let us know about your, your high volume industrial marking project, and especially those where the, the technical solution is still being debated, where you're looking for an alternative to what you know. And of course, we are very welcome that you can talk about Kiva and our solution, and of course, preferably in a good way, which I'm sure you will. Mm -hmm. And I um, take this opportunity to, um, to let's say, to invite you to meet Inspire Europe. Uh, that's where uh, we are uh, this week in Strasbourg. Or I'll be meeting you at the um, EPIC um, general meeting again next week. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roland, for a nice presentation about your solutions. It's time for questions. So uh, again, raise your hands or type your questions in the in the Q and A box. Um, I, I I will start with a question about uh, you mentioned that you can for some cases you need to use a CO two laser in some materials. Uh, femtosecond is more adequate. How different is the module that make the marking? Uh, for each of them. So do you need to change? Of course, the optics must be different, uh, but how different is the internal design or structure of the market solution? That's uh, okay. Um, I didn't bring too many information that short, um, let's say, talk about the, the product. Um, so you see the, the critical optical part in our um, systems or module, this is what you call the special light modulator. This is type of, um, you can picture that as a type of mirror that will interact with the light and shape it in dynamically with the proper um, software uh, instruction. You can see that um, that's a computer generated hologram, in fact. So you kind of program computer and you need that device that we turn the laser light into what you've been uh, creating. Um, so uh, our systems and module, they operate in infrared, in the green, and this is due to the type of technology uh, of a liquid crystal display that we use that does not play well with CO2 on UV, for instance. It might create like uh, absorption point that might be um, a risk for the reliability. So as far as we are concerned right now, we're focusing on this one technology for products. And we're actively developing a uh, different uh, technology for phase modulation. In fact, this is phase modulation, the, the physical um, effect behind all this. And we're, yes, developing in R&D uh, in the integration of different type of phase modulation technology in uh, our existing product um, design, essentially. So to answer a question, this is the same design. There will mm -hmm. be internal components that are moving inside. Okay, very good. Uh, and uh, perhaps to continue with the question I also made to the other speakers, uh, something that perhaps other uh, companies can help you with. Um, you already showed some uh, in your slide, but uh, something that perhaps you are looking for. Um, yes. Uh, yes, yeah. uh, customers like everyone, but it's not very... Um, uh, what is really critical here that uh, we're establishing in our target segments. So um, for the Lux, uh, we we, may have, we think we have a, like a lead customer as well uh, for pharma. We have lead projects. And I'm looking to establish uh, in these other segments where we see a lot of, uh, I found we've been able to demonstrate a lot of interest for so electronics, uh, the automotive with the, the texturing uh, of surface and blasting. And so we're looking for industrial partners that share this vision that, that would uh, understand the uh, uh, the benefits uh, we could um, create together and that would be willing to enter in this, um, um, let's say in this um, like innovation phase that will um, essentially to be our lead um, 
that's your lead partner um uh, like integrating the, the the technology and the solution in in these uh, new segments mm -hmm. very good mm. very good Florent. i don't know if there is any other question or comment for Florent. so if not i thank you very much for the great presentation today yeah, you. for being you here for your time and um, in principle, we should have a final presentation by uh, Fondo Half by Josef Urpes, but unfortunately, I think that he's not uh, here uh, this afternoon. Um, so yeah, I'm very sorry uh, for uh, not having this final presentation. And uh, uh, it seems that, uh, well, we can finish a little bit earlier today than expected. Um, in case there is any final comment or question to any of the speakers, uh, feel free to make it now um, if there is no more comments or questions. So again, it was a pleasure to have you today. Uh, again, to encourage you to check our website to see our next events. Um, as you saw, you are, we are going to cover a lot of different topics in our next uh, uh, meetings, both uh, online and uh, on-site. And again, thank you for the time and uh, uh, I hope you, to see you uh, soon again. Uh, most of you in the AGM probably. Thank you and good afternoon.